Now, in theory, a bear hunt is a simple task. Find the bear, take the bear. But real life is much different, and on Kodiak, that reality is compounded to make one of the toughest hunts in Alaska. Over the 15 years or so that we've had the show in Alaska, I've been on numerous bear hunts and uh, actually only ever taken one grizzly bear, an interior bear. But I've been after a Kodiak bear on two or three different occasions. Well, you go on a Kodiak bear hunt for two reasons, at least I do. Number one is this is the home of the biggest, most monstrous bears in the world. We're talking about 10, 10 and a half, perhaps even 11 foot bear, a bear that could weigh anywhere from 1,000 to 1,300 pounds. When you talk about wanting a trophy bear, this is where you go to do that. Uh, you don't go to Kodiak Island to shoot an eight or eight and a half foot bear. You go to Kodiak to hunt the monster, the 10 foot plus bear. The second thing is the beauty of the land. Uh, we were Uganic Bay, the upper arm of the Uganic Bay area. Very mountainous, very tough walking, but very, very beautiful. If you want to step back in time, and see what early Alaska was all about. Go to Kodiak Island and go up into the mountains and you'll see it. It hasn't changed. It's exactly the way it was two, three hundred, perhaps three thousand years ago. It's still very rugged, very beautiful, very treacherous, but a lot of fun. From a very young age, I was mesmerized by the size of Kodiak bears. My first memory or introduction to one was when I was eight years old. My mom brought home a Field and Stream magazine, and on the cover was a giant Kodiak bear. As I was carrying the groceries into the house, that picture stopped me dead in my tracks. I sat right down on the sidewalk, poured through the article, and let the ice cream melt all over the grass. The thought of ever going to Kodiak and seeing one in person seemed at best remote. But unbeknownst to me, in those days, for even a Kodiak resident to see one of these monster bears was rare. And the reason why bear populations were low at that time is because of extreme competition with commercial hunters who were killing bears for a profit, with canneries that were getting started and had a bounty on bears, and with cattlemen who didn't feel that bears and, bear and cattle could coexist, so they shot everyone they could see. With all that pressure, the bear population was very low. For years and years, Kodiak was famous for Kodiak bears. I mean, in the last couple hundred years, obviously, that's where people went for the monster bears. But in the last few years, the bear concentration, the bear numbers in Kodiak have zoomed. They've gone from about 1,000 bears up to some say 3,000 bears on the island. And the reason for that is that they've had particularly good care and particularly good structure in how they're hunted and when, where they're hunted and when they're hunted. All that comes back to a fellow named Larry Vandale, who's pretty much dedicated his life, his professional life, to the brown bear. Larry Vandale has studied bears around the world, even in Siberia, but his work with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game overseeing Kodiak has had far-reaching effects. From the 1970s, an aggressive management program started. We stopped all the predator management programs. We stopped all of the bounties. We split the island into several different hunt areas, made it so that you had to have every bear inspected. You could only take one bear every four years. You couldn't take sows with cubs. A lot of different things were put together with the main idea being that we wanted to have a quality bear hunt. Not necessarily the most bears around, but a quality hunt with big bears. The best we can tell from our surveys, we've got as many bears now as we've ever had in history here on Kodiak. And we still have a large number of very big bears. And as a result, you don't have to be even a, an experienced bear hunter. A guy like myself that's pretty much a, a, an amateur can walk out in there and you see the net effect. There are bears on Kodiak now that are in excess of 10 and a half, 11 feet. They're in excess of 1,000 pounds. And they're not just a few, there's many that way. And what's happened, because Larry's influence has taken place over the hunters that go up there, he sets up where you draw, how you draw, is that the hunters, when they go there, they don't settle for an eight or an eight and a half foot bear. And so the numbers keep going up and more younger bears are surviving to become those old giants. In fact, about 10% of the Kodiak bears that are taken each year are Boone and Crockett status. Clearly, there's a high quality hunt to be found on Kodiak, but that doesn't mean that it's easy. Physical conditioning is a real factor. You know, having played in the NFL and everything, I know about 
what it means to be physically fit and ready to accept the challenge that's going to, you're going to come up against. Bear hunting is probably one of the most grueling. It fits in somewhere between goats and sheep. You know, it's uphill, it's downhill, it's at the worst time of the year as far as change, the spring and the fall and when changes are happening. So you have to plan for a lot of different things. But physically fit is so important. The guides, they try to impress upon you. I know Randy Quincy from Gold Rush Adventures it made a great statement to me once. He said, Larry, if you're talking about physical conditioning, tell people to get the toughest treadmill they can find, strap on a 35 pound pack and wear that treadmill out. Now don't get me wrong. You'll probably see a lot of bears close by, easy to get to, but those are young ones, inexperienced. The big bears have been through many seasons and know what happens. They stay high and inaccessible, and that's why they're big. So you have to be prepared to travel on their turf. You know, a little bit of a depressing thing happened to me a couple times is we, we closed on bears. We had gone uphill and downhill, and we got to right where the bear was at. And uh, I don't know how to describe this. It's just, when you looked at a mountainside and you know that it's going to take you maybe two hours to get reasonably close to the top of that. And then while you're going down and go across, you spook a Kodiak bear. And a Kodiak bear goes up that same face of that, of that mountain in like two and a half minutes. He looks like a D9, like a dozer, just going right up through the brush. He just mowls it down as he's running and you realize how futile it is to try to follow him. He will cover so much distance in two or three minutes while you're standing there watching, thinking, this guy's never gonna stop. He just goes right up the mountain like he's got four wheel, well, he does have four wheel drive with claws. While the bears of Kodiak are in their element and part of it, we humans have to struggle to maintain a toehold while visiting their domain. There just seems to be a natural tendency towards the uh, I don't know, I, for lack of a better term, call it the intangible factor. Things go wrong. This last spring, I had drawn a permit and had planned a, a bear hunt in Uganic Bay, the upper arm of Uganic Bay, which is a very rugged, rugged place on Kodiak Island. And I had everything planned out because I'd done a lot of suffering in previous bear hunts, you know, sleeping on rocks, uh, not having very good meals, uh, wet, cold, snow, blizzard. So this time I thought, now I've got plenty of time. I've got six months. I'm going to plan this thing out in minutest detail. I contacted a friend that had a commercial fishing boat. I'm talking about a 55 or 60 foot boat. This boat has all the amenities. We can go to Kodiak, the city of Kodiak, get on this boat, sail around the point, go up to the Uganic Bay, pull into the shallow water, we had it all figured out. We were going to have turkey and chicken and flush toilets, showers. We had Smokey Joe things that had been prepared that we were going to use on the boat. Hot food, heat, have all the, the amenities that you would have at home. This boat would pull in and then we'd take a small skiff and every day we would go in and venture back into the mountains or up to the top of the mountains and pursue the bear, bag the bear, bring him back, skin him out, put him on the boat. He couldn't get any better. Four days before the hunt, the boat broke. When you're bear hunting in Kodiak, you gotta do one primary thing. You gotta plan for the unexpected. Now, what does that mean? I don't really know what that means, but trust me, things are going to go wrong. We planned to have a fishing boat that was gonna be the lap of luxury. And four days before we got there, the boat broke. So now we had to run around and grab all the things we needed, tents and camp out. We went to the store to get dehydrated food and all that was left on the shelves because the other bear hunters had been there ahead of us in Kodiak was dehydrated Polynesian chicken. And that's what we ate for 10 days. Of course, preparing for a Kodiak bear hunt is a bit different than preparing for a whitetail hunt in Georgia. Your gear has to be designed for extreme conditions. I'm not talking about new gear. You don't want to take new gear to Kodiak. You need to have gear that you know you can depend on. A fine pair of boots, thermals, rain gear, cover gear, snow gear. You've got to have all the bases covered because chances are in a 10 day period early in the spring or late in the fall, you're going to cover three different seasons in that 10 day period. Um, you know, I think if you folks have watched the show before, you know that I carry a 300 short mag. Um, 
which is pretty much all the gun you need for moose or caribou or goats or sheep or whatever. There's a great variance in, in the heaviness of the slug, depending on which species you're after. But I feel as though um, that falls a little short when you start talking about a Kodiak bear. A moose, caribou, they're pretty much hollow animals. <laughs> But when you get into Kodiak bears, uh, when you get into the bear family at all, period, you need to go with a 300 and on up. Uh, what I carried uh, for the trip was a 375 H and H, and I used a 250 grain slug, solid. I invested in a new scope. I invested in new binoculars and a spotting scope. These are all things that uh, are very important uh, once you're out there, and preferably kind that are uh, gas filled and won't fog. I've had plenty of problems over the years with scopes and uh, binoculars and spotting scopes that fogged up on me. The reason I say that the, uh, the scope is very important is you don't need necessarily a distance scope. Your binoculars, your spotting scope are all for distance, but then the idea is to close on the animal, to set up an ambush point or a, a point of intersection where you think that the animal, after you've been watching him, you try to get up there ahead of him, Take into consideration the wind and all that. Your guide will help you with that. And then set up. But as you're setting up or moving through the brush slowly for reconnaissance, your scope should be ready for the unexpected. Cranking the scope down so that when I put it up, in case we're up close on a bear, in case we're up real close on a bear suddenly, when I throw it up, I've got a greater field of view. In other words, the scope isn't telescopic, it's, it's wide open, so I'll be able to see the bear at point blank range. I'll put a scope on for Kodiak, get a smaller scope, a lesser scope really, because you're using a lot bigger gun at a much closer distance, so you don't need the, the real high powered optics. You need a smaller open view scope where you've got the bear right now when you put it up, in case he pops up 30 yards away, you're, you're not having to find him in the scope and adjust the scope, you've got him right there because you don't want to be making a shot at more than 150, 175 yards, 200 maximum, in my opinion, because you need to get a very lethal shot, first shot. You do not, under any circumstances, want to wound a Kodiak bear by taking a, a shot too far away. You need to set up, take your time, breathe deep, think about what you're doing, and squeeze off a round that's going to be lethal. Because a wounded bear in the brush, uh, you don't want to go there. Respecting these powerful animals is almost inborn. You can't be near one without feeling a bit of awe mixed with trepidation. Long before settlers, the natives on Kodiak believed these bears were from another realm. There was a balance. Native people here, as well as in a lot of other areas, really respected the bear. They felt that the bear was a liaison between the spirit world and our world. And one of the reasons they felt that was the bear went into the grave every fall and it would resurrect itself every spring and for six months a year it was sleeping so it was in the spirit world so couple that with the strength and the danger of one of these critters there was a, a very strong feeling of we've got to coexist with this type of animal you find almost no stories about bear problems and the story you always hear is if you respect bear bear will respect you but if you think about it if you respect an animal that means you take time to understand it if you take time to understand it, you act consistently around it. If you act consistently around it, it's going to act consistently around you and you're going to have fewer problems and you're going to think it's respecting you. So it really does make a difference. When you're out in a spike camp on a hunt, sometimes the little details that make life comfortable get left behind. But when it comes to food, those little details can make the hunt a lot more enjoyable. About the fifth time I opened a bag of Polynesian, now don't get me wrong, I was glad to have my dehydrated uh, food, but it occurred to me how nice it would have been to have Smokey Joe on this trip and have some real grub that he could fix up. But we were caught the last minute, we didn't have Smokey Joe, and I knew when we grabbed all that dehydrated Polynesian chicken that we were probably going down a one-way street. And I wished I had him there, I couldn't get in touch with him, and have him tell me at the store what else I could have got to put together to make it a little better than what it was. When you're traveling light, way out in the bush, freeze dried is the way to go. Like you saw Larry and them out on a bear hunt. Man, when you go a long ways, you wanna travel light. You wanna make sure that you got something that tastes good. So what you do is take some home, go buy some, 
try them out, cook them just the way it says, and you can always add your little bit of hot sauce, some salt, pepper, seasoned salt, garlic salt, and that pack, you can put all that in a Ziploc bag, just make your little blend up, take them with you, season them up, good little tip. And uh, if we'd have had him there with us at the store, just walking around, I know Joe, he would have had all kinds of little things in the basket that would have uh, put a whole different slant on Polynesian chicken by the third day. Honestly though, the food was minor compared to the challenges of transportation. We came close to scrapping the whole hunt after our boat arrangements fell through. Flight services were already booked up by other hunters, so we were extremely grateful when our friends at Andrew Airways were able to fit us in for a drop off. We are pretty much an on-demand air taxi. We service a big mixed bag of clientele. We, the hunting, of course, we're right in the middle of spring bear hunting. Hunt planning, of course, includes scheduling drop-offs and pickups with your air service. But choosing dates isn't just about what's open in their flight calendar. A lot of that depends on what kind of winter we're having. We're having a real mild winter. Uh, bears might be coming out early. If they're having a real cold winter. They might be. You might want to be getting more into the May type hunting instead of coming in the beginning part of April. So we'll drop them off and they'll specify when we want to pick them up. Uh, but most of the time we're trying to continually check on them because a lot of times they might finish early or so forth and some people will have communications, some won't, some will just put a tarp out if they want an early pickup or something. So it's a matter of us flying over from time to time, taking a look down where they're at, see a blue tarp or something, swoop in and get them out. Well, our tarp was out, but not to signal a plane. Halfway through the trip, we were hemmed in by a storm that would have made flying nearly impossible. It's a rare day that you fly around here and it's not turbulent. So we you get a lot of high winds and so forth. We get a lot of low pressure systems that come up from the Aleutian Islands and hit Kodiak. So a, a pilot has to get really used to the weather and be able to get, get through it. And, uh, and they need some experience to be able to learn that. So I'm looking for guys that got a lot of hours of actual this kind of bush flying. It's not really instrument, it's not instrument flying coming into these bays and so forth, so you need to know the terrain and it just takes time, you know. To schedule flights with Andrew Airways, call Dean Andrew at 907-487-2566 and go to andrewairways.com. Plates from Anchorage were provided by Era Aviation. Call toll free 800-866-8394 or flyera.com. Now, there's one thing that I need to talk about. I told you a lot of bad things that, that can go wrong on a bear hunt. Here are some of the good things. You're going to a place where there aren't many people there most of the year, nine or 10 months of the year, there's hardly anyone there. And the deer, the Sitka black-tailed deer, literally would walk up 10 or 12 feet from us, and put their ears up and look at us. They weren't sure what we were. Foxes. These critters are not only uh, numerous, they're almost tame, they're almost domestic because they, they don't know to have any fear of man. And during the course of that, I watched sun up and sun down for two or three days. I watched the tide come in and go out. And the beauty of that we can bring you a little bit through time-lapse photos, but it, it's truly inspiring. It's, it's awesome is what it is. Kodiak Island is, is not a land of man. It's a land of bears. I got the feeling that they knew from the minute our plane landed that we were there. The bears rule. So when you go into camp and set up, uh, you don't think about other people. You think about where the bears are because they're all around you and it's their ground. And when I say rugged, I'm talking about top of the Rocky Mountain type rugged. But make no mistake, 
If you want the biggest and the best, go to Kodiak. For all the information you need on permit drawings, regulations, and setting up a Kodiak bear hunt, go to the Alaska Department of Fish and Game website.